What up, Wizards? It's D.E.V. from SVMTG, where the magic happens. And I'm here today to talk to you about the dangers of peer pressure. Because in a format where I think two things are true, one, Solta Yorion, best deck in the format, and two, Extinction Event, best sweeper in the format. I think it'd be smart of us to check back in on an all-but-forgotten two-card combo in Mono Black. Now, the good news is, deck's not bad. Deck is not as terrible as I thought it was going to be, but the bad news is... I think it's actually pretty easy to build this deck poorly at the moment, as you'll see from this screenshot, because I've made this deck 10 or 12 different times at this point, finally settled on a build that I think can win right at the moment I thought I was going to go mad, because I guess it's true, you stare into the abyss for long enough, and it stares back at you. But I'm better now, and as I was saying, I think I've finally got a version of this deck that I think is worthy of presenting to you. So today let's hang out, chill on the couch, and talk about how to OTK some fools with underworld dreams and peer into the abyss. I'm back. I would never leave you. Now it's possible that you've made it an entire minute into this video without even knowing what combo I'm talking about. In which case, thank you. Consider liking and subscribing, hitting the bell for the notifications. That's all the self-promotion I'll do for now. We'll get back to it at the end of the video. But anyway, let's actually talk about what we're doing before we talk about how to do it, which I think is way more important. But in case you haven't seen this combo yet, it's Underworld Dreams and Peer Into the Abyss. Now, Underworld Memes, excuse me, Underworld Dreams pings your opponent for a damage whenever they draw a card, which sure can eventually end a game, especially if you have multiple copies of them out. But even with two copies, it's still kind of a slow burn. Your opponent can very likely just ignore it and uh, kill you. That's how that usually works. So you have to speed up the process and peer into the abyss is probably the best way of doing that in standard because it makes your opponent draw a whole stack of cards. Do you see? Do you see the combo? Now the combo is both Nito and Burrito, undeniably. It's only two cards and it will kill your opponent unless they only have a few cards left in their library, but I would imagine if there's only like 12 cards left in their stack, Underworld Dreams has already done a buttload of damage to them, so Peer into the Abyss might still do the job in that event. But anyway, it's not the coolness of the combo that's on trial here. It's if the combo is actually viable, and that's where the problem comes in. You see, you have to absorb an entire turn playing like a do-nothing enchantment. Again, most people just ignore the Underworld Dreams. And then you have to resolve a 7-drop. You have to get to a 7-drop. So there's some basic issues inherent to this combo here that we have to solve. It's not necessarily these eight cards that are the issue with the deck. It's the 28 or so other cards that you play around it to make it work. And that's why your dude spent like three weeks and 12 decks worth of mental energy trying to figure out what those 28 or so cards are supposed to be. But I think we finally got it figured out. So let's talk about the rest of the stuff because that's, that's what's important here. Now it's been a while. <laughs> It's been a while. I can't say it's been a while without thinking of that terrible song. Uh, but anyway, it has been some time since we've checked in on this deck and we've gotten some cool new stuff for it since the last time we really looked at its viability. And one of the best new things we got was a couple of sets ago in Kaldheim. We got Dream Devourer. And one of the best ways of making this combo actually playable is just speeding it up. And I've tried a bunch of different ways. You play green black with like cultivate and ramp spells and stuff and it's just Still surprisingly bad, still, still fairly bad, but Dream Devour is actually a really sweet card. Not only can we foretell the Peer into the Abyss to make it only cost five mana, which is good, right? Especially in sequence, where you go Dream Devourer on two, or you can go Underworld Dreams on three, and then Dream Devourer on four, foretell the Peer, then drop a land on turn five, Peer into the Abyss, and you've won. You can just pack it up. You've won the game at that point. Um, you could also, I guess, play Devourer on two, Foretell the Peer on three, then on four you play Underworld Dreams, and then on five you go Peer into the Abyss. So you see how much this card affects the sequencing of the deck. But there's other cards in the deck we can foretell here. I mean, there's another seven drop that we're playing that we'll get to in a second. But there's plenty of other, you know, four or five drop cards in this deck that benefit from being foretold by this guy and let you double spell and even triple spell on certain turns where that's really, really important to be able to do that. Making things like Extinction Event cost two or Shadow's Verdict cost three is kind of a game changer. If you want to get the best starts possible and fire off the combo, as quickly as you can. Dream Devourer is basically your best bet in mono black of getting that done. And I tried other stuff like Nyx Lotus and whatnot, but just nothing was anywhere near as good, in my experience at least, as Dream Devourer was. And again, 
playing Peer into the Abyss is not the only thing this card does. Because when I was building this deck, one of the first hurdles that we really had to get over was the fact that the deck just doesn't really have any dimension to it, right? You either get the combo, or you don't get the combo, or the combo gets countered, or you don't get to the combo. Either way, that's a bunch of ways to lose the game, right? So the deck needs other ways of winning the game. And it turns out, one of the best ways of doing that is to just play Valky in your deck. Now this turned out to be the best way of winning games outside of the combo that we could play in this deck. And yes, by the way, it does work the way you want it to. If you foretell a Valky with a Dream Devourer, you can cast Tybalt for just five mana on turn five. And a lot of players like this one here will just look at it for a few seconds before they scoop. And this is more than just a game-ending Planeswalker, although it does do that pretty well, but it's also card advantage, something that this color combination, I was going to say mono black again, but this card is obviously has some red in it. So can I legally call this deck mono black? Maybe, because, I mean, Valky is the front face of the card and it's mono black. That's a whole philosophical debate. Deck is probably Rakdos at the end of the day. But anyway, <laughs> that's not what's important. <laughs> you know, this is also card advantage. It does end games sometimes, and as a creature, it can get important cards out of the opponent's hand or just like block and trade that's really important some of the time too or just become something awesome on occasion so a lot of cool stuff that Valky does it's again a multi-dimensional card which is what this deck needed the most but we're not done with the big stupid bombs i don't know why you thought we'd be done with those i love big stupid bombs so we're gonna play one copy of professor onyx in the deck really sweet card i've been thinking about bumping this up to two but i don't know what to take out uh, at this point and i don't want to i want to stare into the abyss any longer. So with that in mind, I'm stuck with one copy of Professor Onyx here, but I wouldn't wouldn't blame you if you wanted to shift that up by one because this card is ridiculous. And also, can end games, whether you hit in the ultimate, which has happened a few times, amazingly. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Or if it's just the mage crap trigger, you know, on top of Underworld Dreams or maybe a couple of copies of Underworld Dreams, Magecraft on Liliana can really speed a game up. It only takes two or three spells sometimes to end things or put things out of reach for an opponent that got you to a low life total. So just the drain on the Magecraft trigger is incredible, right? But it's also card advantage. We've already talked about it. We need that. So this helps with that. And it's removal in and of itself, the same way Tybalt is. So just a sweet, just a great Planeswalker that does a whole bunch of stuff. I kind of tie everything together just a little bit. I might as well go ahead and tell you about the one copy of Grim Tutor in the deck. Just the one, I probably should tell you there's a fair number of one-ofs in this deck too. That's a product of tuning is, is what that is. That's a tuned, there's a lot of one-ofs in this deck. But of course, playing a Grim Tutor kind of means we can play a little bit more of a toolbox strategy, right? So the one of Grim Tutor, I would not increase to any more copies, but it is nice to have this silver bullet to go find the Peer into the Abyss or find the Underworld Dreams if we already have the Peer, find the Valky if that's what's important, maybe find a Sweeper or a removal spell. There's so many things for Grim Tutor to do that it's often very much worth the three life. It's a combo deck, play tutors, but we also need to draw more cards. That's right, Grim Tutor effectively draws a card, Liliana draws a card, Tibble draws cards. I mean, they all, they draw cards, but I want more. I gotta have more. It's a combo deck. We're looking to find two specific cards. Sometimes we have to find them multiple times if they get countered or something like that. So we, got, we gotta find cards, baby. That's what we gotta do. So we're gonna play three copies of Lithoform Blight and two copies of Maze Mind Tome. Now, Instinct tells me that you could probably switch these numbers around because Maze Mind Tome is just the better card, but I do like with the form Blight. This allows us to play the Blight on one of our own lands, so we have a red source to play Tibble. That's important to remember. These are effectively three more red sources, so that, that's important sometimes, but often you will put these on your opponent's important lands, especially their blue sources and stuff. That way, if they do want to tap for important colors of mana, they're going to have to pay for it. So together with Underworld Dreams and again, the Magecraft on Liliana and stuff like that, these pings can really, really add up and sometimes even lock your opponent out of making mana with certain lands. On the other hand, Maze Mind Tome is uh, just a great way of drawing cards. In any monocolored deck that usually can't draw cards, Maze Mind Tome is this, um, is this incredible godsend. It's just an amazing card that um, will draw you up to four cards. And even if it's just smoothing out draws by way of scrying, I'll take that. And we very often need the life that we get at the end of this card's life cycle. So everything about Maze Mind is great, and I would support three copies. Now, basically, the entire rest of the main deck here is removal. I can run through that pretty fast, but there are reasons why I'm playing certain removal pieces that I think are interesting to talk about. So let's start with three copies of Heartless Act, surprising absolutely no one. But we've also got a copy 
of Easy Prey and a copy of Blood Chief's Thirst, just to round things out. Now, Blood Chief's Thirst actually isn't my favorite removal spell in the format. It does pretty well against Luminarch Aspirants and stuff like that, but I hate the sorcery speed on it. One of the big reasons we're playing this is so we have a good out against Planeswalkers. That also kind of works against smaller creatures. I'll take both of those modes, thank you very much, but I don't want to play too many Blood Chief's Thirst. Again, I don't think the sorcery speed is great in this day and age. I really don't. Where Heartless Act can kill Winotis and Yorions and all kinds of stuff. Lovestruck Beasts and whatnot at instant speed, whereas Blood Chief's Thirst is not super good at that. So I, th I think Heartless Act is just the best two mana removal spell in standard right now. And um, having an instant speed spell to kill Winotis and whatnot is super important. So you play that card. But we're also playing a copy of Easy Prey, which is the weirdest looking removal spell in the deck. But this again can take out Luminarch Aspirants, or Aspirants, however you say it. I'm not going to bag on you for that. But there's also, you know, stuff like Robber the Rich and all manner of one drops and two drops, Edgewall Innkeeper, blah, blah. There's a ton of small creatures that Easy Prey takes out. But just in case, in game one, you're up against that Yorion deck, you're up against that control deck, this is another way of drawing cards. All right? And most removal spells are, by and large, dead in these control-based matchups. And yeah, Heartless Act can kill a Yorion. Sometimes that's great. But there's other times where it just sits in your hand forever until they finally play their Yorion, and then you don't really care, you know? It's like, like, I'm glad that I can kill their Yorion, but it's like the only thing that Heartless Act does in some matchups. So I like to draw Easy Prey in those matchups and maybe cycle it away to get a card closer to the combo. And we're also on two Elspeth's Nightmare and a copy of Palakar Predation, which isn't the best card in the world, but it can get Emergent Ultimatums and Goldspan Dragons and all manner of other stuff out of your opponent's hand. It's really nasty. And, importantly, it can get stuff like Saw It Coming if they haven't foretold it yet, or Mystical Dispute, right? Clear the way for that Peer into the Abyss. So Palaka Predation is pretty sweet. Or it can just be a land, and you need lands in this deck because you're trying to get to a 7-drop. So it's good for that purpose, too. But Elspeth's Nightmare, the better card. Uh, obviously, this is removal, so that's good. But the second mode on it is maybe the most important. This effectively duresses your opponent so you can get important stuff out of their hand. Again, namely counter spells, so that you can make sure they don't have counter magic against that Peer into the Abyss. Maybe one of the most important cards in the entire deck is Elspeth's Nightmare, but we also have two copies of Hagra Mauling, as well as three copies of Extinction Event and a Shadow's Verdict, because I am not playing with these aggro decks. Seriously, we gotta have some sweepers in the main deck, or we'll lose the game. That's just, that's just how it works out. We can have all the best one-for-one -one removal in the format, and we do mostly have all the best one-for-one -one removal, but still, if we can't sweep the board, we're basically done -zo. So let's play at least four main deck sweepers, and once we get to the board, we'll play even more. There are 24 non-MDFC lands in the deck. With MDFCs, there's 27, which sounds like a lot, but I kind of advocate for one more land in this deck, if you can fit it, to be like another Palaka Predation or something like that, I think would work, because there's almost no such thing as Flood in this deck. Now, I am a little bit weird about the Crawling Barons in the deck, but so far, in a lot of testing with this thing, it hasn't prevented me from casting an Underworld Dreams on turn three. Good news is, if it did, you don't necessarily have to cast Underworld Dreams on turn three in a lot of situations, so there's that. But I think it's worth it to play one copy of a land that's capable of winning the game in some situations, so why not do that? Aside from that, Pathways, and we're also playing Temples. The Rakdos Temple rather than Savi Trion, because again, it's few and far between that you want to cycle a land away. You basically need all your lands in this deck as you draw them. And I'd rather have a scry. Because if you if you scry, you, you get to set up, you get to try and find combo pieces. So yeah, all, all together, this is one of the very, very few decks that I think the temples are better than triomes. Let's look at the sideboard here and start with the most important card in the sideboard, which is actually Duress. I'm serious, this card. This card is extremely important to this sideboard. And honestly, I really want to work a couple of copies into the main deck where I think this card belongs, but I'm just really not sure what to cut for it in the main. If you're in best of one, I think you want some duress in that main deck. Son or daughter, whatever, kid, <laughs> viewer, dear viewer, play duress in your deck. You know, you see a situation on screen right now where we're able to duress a disdainful stroke out of our opponent's hand and win the game with a peer. That literally was the difference between winning and losing that game. And that happens very, 
very often. This extra hand disruption against control decks is insanely important for making sure that we actually win games of magic against people who play blue sources. So, play duress. Aside from that, we've also got Cling to Dust in the deck. This is to gain life against some aggro decks, but mostly to draw cards and give us a way to play out of our graveyard. Again, a little bit of extra dimension, and again, in best of one, I think it's probably worth working in one Cling to Dust. Aside from that, Skyclave Shade is up next. We'll play this against control. Murder Murderous Rider is if we need more uh, Planeswalker removal. The planeswalkers are quite good against us because we don't really have a lot of removal for them, so I'm going to play a Murderous Rider, but this can also come in against Winota decks just so you have another instant speed way of taking her out. So There's a few reasons a Murderous Rider can come in. Soul Shatter is in there against Dream Trawlers and against decks like uh, Ultimatum that'll play a Kiora Best the Sea God. You can make them sacrifice their 8-8. There is only one copy of this in here, but it is highly specialized, and I would not cut this for the world. Also, an Ugin, uh, the Spirit dragon because why not as my chat would say on twitch more ugin right morgan is always good and uh, if we can get to a seven drop we can get to this especially if we're playing dream devour thus making ugin a six drop i think it's probably worth it to play a copy of ugin in case we want that especially if the opponent has hard to deal with permanent types ugin is pretty good and then an erebos's intervention a way to gain a whole bunch of life at one time which is sometimes important a way to play against seasoned hallow blades which is often important and another way of getting stuff out of the opponent's graveyard which is only important on a tertiary basis, but it's still sometimes important. Now here are your power rankings. Final score is 65, but don't let that fool you. It sounds like a low score, but I actually think this deck is somewhat well positioned right now. If you're smart, you can play around counter spells. Again, especially in games two and three where you have more hand disruption. But even in game one, you have some hand disruption. Use it wisely, get the counter spells out of their hand, and then resolve your stupid game ending combo. It can work. But where this deck really shines tends to be against the aggro decks. I mean, you probably heard me say this does something about Winota like a million times. I'm sure you've noted that at this point. But this deck also has plenty of main deck answers to mono white aggro, like Extinction Event, main deck Shadows Verdict and whatnot, which is really hard for those decks to come back from, and just really, really good removal as well. While, and I think this is important, not sacrificing too many slots to have all these dead cards against control decks. Again, against Soltai Yorion, we got plenty of cards. Even against like your Demir control decks, we have card draw in the form of Lithiform Blight, and Maze Mind Tholm, Professor Onyx. We have all these huge bombs that the opponent might be able to counter the first one, but maybe they can't counter the second peer, or the second Valky, or the Professor Onyx, or whatever. You know, we've got this litany of huge bombs that the opponent is probably going to run out of counter magic for, especially if we can wisely play our hand disruption. And that's why the example game that I've chosen for this video is actually a game against a deck that I feared coming into testing this deck. We're playing against the blue-red controller, is it tempo deck, whatever you want to call it, that's gotten a lot of attention lately, mostly because of some really good tournament results last weekend. A lot of eyeballs on this deck again now, and I was very worried that we would come up against it. It turns out, though, that the matchup you're seeing here is a fairly typical representation of this matchup. We play through the counter spells, force them to counter some key spells, and then keep playing more key spells, and eventually even use some of the tricks up our sleeve to make them understand that we are going to land this combo, and we're not going to take no for an answer. Good game, opponent. That's all for this one, and I hope you enjoyed it because I worked very hard on <laughs> this one, trying to find exactly the right list. Like I said, I think that there's a lot of ways to uh, poorly build this deck right now, and I'm about to test one of them out on Twitch. 
actually, on Sunday night, if you come over to the Twitch channel, that's twitch.tv slash spmtgdev, I'll be testing out the weirdest version of this deck that I put together. But it's uh, still a fun one. That's all I'm going to say for now. Hopefully, you'll come follow us over on Twitch. But aside from that, make sure you let me know how you felt about this one and anything that I may have missed. I tried just about every black card in the format. <laughs> And almost every colorless card in the format in this deck in my search for the for the perfect beat. But, you know, I still am open to suggestions. So get down there in the comments section. Let me know how you'd build things differently. Aside from that, do all the stuff. Here's self-promotion. Please stick around for it. It would mean a lot to me. I care about you. <laughs> Make sure you like, subscribe, hit the bell for the notifications. I don't know why just subscribing doesn't give you notifications. It seems like that would be the function of the subscribe button. But you also have to hit the bell ring the bell for the notifications aside from that you can check me out on patreon if you really want to support the channel but i'll give you something for that one dollar of your money every month just one dollar of of money any money really every month equivalent to a dollar and you get to vote on what content we even do that's why we're doing this video patrons voted on it if you want to be one of them people and really affect things because a lot of votes tend to be very close so if you want to affect the course of youtube history all it costs is a dollar a month. Do that. Also, follow me on Twitch, like I said, and do any other things that would benefit me. Oh, yeah, you check out the deck list down there. If, if you want to, you can get it on TCG Player. It's super cheap. They got cheap prices, so go do that. Check the deck list out. Helps me when you do that. Helps me. So that, that would also benefit me. But, hey, don't forget to benefit yourself. That's important. Go ahead and take care of yourself. Go out there and win some games with this deck, and I'll catch you cats later. I'm dead from the place. Thanks for watching, Wizards. Spread love and be kind. Yeah, I'm feeling rich and I'm finally about to cash out. Smothered and covered like I'm some hash browns. Glass clown, stash crowns till I pass out. Bass trout, lobster on my plate.